uh, like we liked each other, and uh, it seemed to go well. And um, it was then that I started to develop my, my David Lynch uh, in, impression. Yes. Ray, <laughs> it's you, it was always you. <laughs> Believe me, well, I, I had to go back and look at the script to find out about Leland Palmer again because I didn't really remember him. I'm thinking Sheriff Truman. So I got a call the next day saying, uh, uh, I think David is interested in you to play Leland Palmer. I said, ooh, who's, wait a minute. So I'm, I'm looking through the script and I see, yeah, this is Leland Palmer. He finds out his daughter's dead and he cries. He goes to the morgue to identify her body and he cries. <laughs> He goes up in the bedroom while the sheriff's department is searching the bedroom, and he cries. <laughs> and the guy goes about a big crybaby. <laughs> and that's what I initially thought when I looked at it, and then of course, it developed into what it was, which turned out to be the greatest character I've ever had the honor and privilege of playing. The writing was, the writing was, uh, the writing was superb, and. Um, and I get chills every time I, I think about the beginning uh, when we did the pilot. And David, of course, uh, set the tone for all of it. He has an uncanny knack for saying just the right thing at just the right time. It can just be a few words, but it triggers, uh, it triggers everything. And, uh, and then everything sort of explodes out of that. And, uh, it happened over and over and over again. Go ahead. Anyway, that's how I got. And that's how I got the part, and uh, I was happy. <laughs> we were all happy that you got it. <laughs> uh, I did. Uh, I did a you know, session campaign with uh, with David with uh, Larry Flynn Boyle, and we showed over two days. And on the second day, uh, David looked at me and said, "You make a good dick." <laughs> and I said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> he said, you're going to come see me on Tuesday. And I did, and I got the big from so. <laughs> there you are. What else would you like to know about? <laughs> and I made a very good dick. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Uh, material 
like the diary to work with is an actor's dream. Um, I too had the same fears and confusion and shame and everything else. And um, I'm just deeply grateful that I had your words. <laughs> so I was living in Seattle and I got a call, I was doing theater and I got a call from an agent up there that said um, that David Lynch was in town casting something that had to do with TV and nobody knew what it was and he had seen my picture and thought maybe I was this dead girl, would I come <laughs> meet him? <laughs> and I was so nervous, I sat on both of my hands like this and, and fortunately he doesn't have his actors read so I just talked to him and um, he asked me uh, how I would feel about being wrapped in plastic and squirted with freezing cold water and possibly thrown in a lake wrapped in plastic. <laughs> and I said, fine. <laughs> I was from Colorado. I was used to cold water and weather. I could deal with that. And he said it was for this dead girl and there might be some fresh sex scenes. And that was it. He was so kind and... Um, and that was, that was kind of it. And so I was hired for, to play the dead girl. And then some um, flashbacks, and then I thought that was it, and then got a call from him months later. They had all come back to LA. And he said, well, you know, do you want to come back on the show? And I said, well, I'm dead. <laughs> and he said, well, don't worry about that. I'll figure something out. <laughs> I said, well, if it's coming there to LA to work with you and everybody else, then I'm there, I'm on the next plane, so that's how I started. Hello. <laughs> well, uh, I lived in Seattle as well, in the same audition session, same experience. Um, something I do remember from talking to David, um, my name on my picture was my maiden name uh, because I was newly married at the time. Yeah, yeah first year of marriage. And um, I told him that that's what my picture says, but I'm married now and I would like to use my married name. And he said, what's your married name? And I told him and he said, no. <laughs> certain characters come back, focus on certain things, um, add some new material. I mean, it's a good 40, 35, 40 minutes before we even get to Twin Peaks. Um, tell us about those first conversations that you had and what you were going to focus the writing on. Well, the, the, uh, David and I were writing a script called In Heaven at that point. Um, and uh, um, David, I, I think I was, I was at the house and David came home uh, and said, uh, I, I want to do uh, another Twin Peaks movie. That's where it started, right? So I, I'm not sure where that came from. Um, so we, we wanted to do a prequel and a sequel, right? I mean, that was kind of the idea. And, and I think we started with, um, as I recall, we started with trying to figure out how, how would, how would this have started and, and then how would, uh, how would you go beyond that? You know, what I mean, pretty simple. And then the, uh, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest mission was to try to include everybody. You know, 
And I think everybody got shot in the movie. I, every, I think everybody that was a regular had a, had a scene or a sequence, and, uh, and then slowly they got to the, the, the time shrunk down. But it was really a, a, um, a sense of, I think, that they generally that, that, that I think it was a sense of it not being complete. You know what I mean? That there was a, there was a, there was more to tell about the story that that we all liked, and, and it was really an attempt to, uh, um, well, let's see what else what else could we tell about the story? And there were lots of stuff. The first draft was uh, probably twenty pages, twenty to twenty pages. There was stuff in Argentina, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us at that stage in Jeffrey stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. What what goes on in Argentina? Uh, I think a hotel was on fire. I remember that we shot some of that. The way that I said that. And then um, uh, and it was about Josie and uh, um, Wyndham Merle was there, right? And I think that was the idea. Um, so we, th that, was, that, that was actually shot, but then there was also a whole sequence of um, uh, um, 1954, 56, the inauguration day of Eisenhower. Scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and the, and the, uh, uh, there were bugs under a formica uh, table, that was all, something like that. <laughs> so there was lots of stuff that we, that we fiddled with, you know? I mean, it was like, um, let me step back. The, the biggest thing is that the writing experience is there that is so unique in the sense that, that you kind of go wherever you go, right? You know, so, um, we would hit on something, and then we'd do ten pages on that, and I, you know, and so so somehow that all became part of the script because it was all part of of, of sort of what uh, we were talking about, and you know what David wanted to do. Um, uh, you, you know, it's, it's the whole um, dreamlike quality to the whole series, right? So that so that it's not it's it's not an extension to say. Um, oh, this could start in 1954. It could start in 1854. <laughs> it could start in 1054. You know, um, and and I think that was the that, that was the, the the that's where we started, right? And I remember we watched a lot of the Shoppers Channel at the same time or something. <laughs> Go figure. There, and dare I ask what the conversation about a sequel between two Uh No, you know, it was really not so much a sequel, but a just how we how we would go beyond. The, where the series had been set, yeah. And uh, no, I don't think there was any of that. No. Well, I don't think David's saying uh, the, the town is still there, right? But <laughs> you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so when we started all of this back in January, it was at a moment where there was an explosion of rumors about season, a supposed season three. And Jen, you were one of the first to say this ain't happening. Uh, I waited a long time to say anything. I, you know, my Facebook page was just, you know, coded in. This is so exciting that they're bringing Twin Peaks back, and and I thought, well, I'm either really fucking out of loop, or <laughs> this is not true. And uh, I called Dad and I said, uh, so a new Twin Peaks, and he says, no, from the horse's mouth, Jenna, no. And you know, I, I'm I'm all for it staying this thing that everybody wishes were still around, like all good things, all good lovers, all good meals, and yet it's not, <laughs> and it should be uh, where it is. I think you know, it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful memory. I wouldn't want to see it now with newer actresses in that town trying to be Twin Peaks. I think that would I'd stab myself in the eye. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Ray. <laughs> I would also say that what, what is truly unique about the series, in the sense of actors uh, and, and everybody involved, is that everybody's still pretty friendly. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. It, you know, you're happy to see them. I haven't seen them in years. Most of them. But it, it, uh, most series that you work on, if they say, you know, we're, we're going to show some of the series, and then would you like to come and talk to me? Say, is that fucker going to be there? Because <laughs> if he is, I'm not. You know what I mean? And we all have that experience. It's like, or tell him to shut the fuck up. You know? And I think that's, that, that's, if you guys have seen, and seen all the guests come and all this stuff, 
Th there really isn't that, that feeling, you know, I don't yeah. think. Well, well, it's a testament, I think, to all the personalities involved as well, right? Yeah. The material and the, the people. And no, so we, saw, we, we sort of jived right at the beginning. We really did, all of us. And then uh, after the pilot, uh, we just knew what we were doing. And, and they brought in some great directors, you know, movie directors, and, and, and uh, they, of course, tried to put their stamp on us. But we knew what we were doing. <laughs> and we kept that, we kept it constant and consistent throughout. Yeah, it's complete. I mean, you say that, it, it, um, you know, at that point, uh, network strips were 54, 55 pages. Yeah. You know, sometimes we were 38. Di Diane Keaton's was 38. Mm -hmm. 38 pages. It's like, what the fuck are they going to do, right? <laughs> but it, you know, but you guys, longingly at things. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to um, actually go back to the, the Secret Diary and ask Cheryl what sorts of things inspired you from that book. What helped you? Do you remember anything in particular? Yeah, I mean, it's... For, for the way that I work is I kind of let that... Uh, it's almost like the spirit of that character pull me to them. And sometimes that's physical, Sometimes that's through learning a physical skill that that character does, like um, I learned photography for playing acid and backbeat. And sometimes it's um, intellectual, you know, it's studying something or learning the language or that that character lives in. And with Laura, it was, you know, just raw emotion. And living with that, the shame and the secrets and the double life and so it's hard, it's a hard one for me to even talk about because I still have such a um, you know I feel it even sometimes just hearing it or hearing a song I feel that the heart of her um, and the way the rawness and the truth with which Jen wrote that. I mean, it, it was all there for me. There was, all I had to do was like, just plug in to that. And then it was there. I knew who she was. I could feel her from deep within inside. And um, so that was, I mean, it was just, you know, my God, what a gift. <laughs> you know, yeah, but look what you did with it. I mean, holy crap. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> James, you uh, you have an interesting, I think, dilemma to you know to deal with with approaching your character because on one hand, kind of visually, your character would be the archetypal bad boy, the biker, but instead you're actually a very sweet guy, and there's a much badder boy uh, that Laura's dating. I'm curious to know how you develop that character, what David gave you to sort of, uh, and, and Mark gave you to um, kind of approach the way that you were going to play him? Well, I think basically, um, you know, everybody, in my opinion, everybody liked that. In anyway, they're kind of like not who they seem to be, like even in growing up. Oh, sorry. I think, oh, okay. I just figured I'd talk a little louder. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, hey. I wonder why he got this up. Sorry to get insecure. Why did they get, you know? <laughs> You got the Harley. Yeah, why well, you know, <laughs> trailer with the Well anyway. nobody had trailers. Yeah, exactly. You got a little cubicle going on. Cubicle. Anyway. And, uh, except for Pat, he had his own uh, airstream. Airstream, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But he brought that from home. <laughs> uh, yeah, but basically everybody's like, I grew up on the East Coast in New Jersey, which is very similar to the Northwest. And um, basically, mm, David's take on life is only weird in that life is weird. I mean, his take on life is so, ra to me, it's so razor focused. That's why it almost seems like he's on like, people would joke that, oh, it's like, you know, this is like on mushrooms or something, or it's like, it's because he's so clear and has such an intense clarity and focus as to what he wants and what he knows the truth is that it, the truth itself just takes you on this ride right into, if you let it, if you really, it can flip you out, I mean. So 
he basically, like the underbelly of everything, is what I think of David as like lifting up the underbelly and seeing what's on the other side, and it's never what you think it's going to be kind of thing. But in my opinion, the bad boy, back when I was growing up, the bad boy was the guy who generally was, it was very honest, it was the guy who did great girls with the letter on his jacket, who was like, you know, he was the real, like, so that, that guy did that. Meanwhile, all those guys with the long hair in the back smoking cigarettes were like, we defend the girl, you know what I mean? You know, but he looked like, it just it was very much, to me, just right along the lines. So, but I think, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little nervous in front of all you guys. <laughs> but, uh, um, I think both. Basically, I think like when, when he, uh, Ray was saying that we all just fit right into uh, exactly into our characters, you couldn't really do to us too much because basically that's what David does on instinct. He'll, that's why he doesn't read anybody because he'll just kind of feel them out and look at them and kind of feel them and understand what he's dealing with and say, nope, next. And then just keep going until he gets that. They're just gonna fit right, they are. He does, he's not gonna have to do anything. <clears throat> In fact, like one of my favorite, one of my favorite things that he ever did with me was his direction. He would rarely give directions, only once in a while. He would kind of coax, and he would coax you because he wouldn't want to disturb too much of what was going on. And um, so he gets like, the scene was going good, and I think it was between me and Donna, and it was like usual, and it was uh, some, something or other about some, you know, right before kissing, which it usually was or whatever. <laughs> but, but it was like, some intense talk about something, but there was definitely an angst-ridden emotional build that was starting to happen and it needed to go somewhere, peak a little bit, and then almost comedically kind of turn into just this now what do we do moment and then kiss. And he wasn't getting, he was getting everything, but I could tell he wasn't all the way, he kept coming over and going, I don't know, uh, James, could you, and then you walk away and just go, go ahead. And then finally he comes over and he'd always wear this bill, like the hat with the bill, and he comes walking over, and he's real intense, and he goes, stop, just hold it. Uh, and he comes over, and he usually would give Donna directions, you know. So in this time, he comes over to me, you know, yeah, I just feel like kissing, you know. I was always like, breathe a little more, like, you know. So, and I was used to that, so I was used to sitting alone and waiting for him to get done. And then this time, he comes walking over, and, and comes right to my knees, and we're on, on this, it was shooting down here, it wasn't on the pilot, so we were here, and it was, it was like, uh, on a sofa in Donna's living room or something, and he comes right to my knees, and all the camera guy, everybody's around, and he comes to my knees and he squats, and all I see, it was like a moment out of Eraserhead, because all I saw was, was David squatting, and his bill, his hat, the bill of his hat like this, and his hands up here like this, both of them, going like this for about three minutes straight. <laughs> going, 